John 4, book of John, chapter 4, find verse 20, 27. Let's read. Are you ready? Verse 27 through 41 from the New International 1984 version. Are you ready? Just then his disciples returned, and they were surprised to find him talking with a woman. No one asked, what do you want, or why are you talking with her? Then leaving her water pot, or her water jar, the woman went back to the town and said to the people, quote, come and see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Christ? And they came out of the town and made their way toward him. Meanwhile, his disciples urged him, Rabbi, eat something. Verse 32, but he said to them, I have food to eat that you know nothing about. And his disciples said to each other, could someone have come and brought him some hummus and crackers? That's an emphasis is mine there. Verse 34, my food, Jesus said, is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. Do not say four months more and then the harvest. I, say, I tell you, open your eyes and look. I want you to read that part. Open your eyes and look at the fields, for they are ripe with harvest. Even now the reaper draws his wages. Even now he harvests the crop for eternal life. So the sower and the reaper may be glad together. Thus the saying, one sows and another reaps, is true. I sent you to reap what you did not work for. Others have done hard work, and you have reaped the benefits of their labor. Verse 39. Many of the Samaritans from the town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. Why did they believe? Because of the woman's testimony. He told me everything I ever did in verse 40. So when the Samaritans came to him, they urged him to stay with him, and he stayed two days. And because of his words, many more became believers. Father, thank you for what you've done already. We could go home. We've already heard from you, been greatly encouraged and strengthened, and we're thankful for that. Now as I preach and teach your word, I pray that we would have ears to hear and hearts to respond. Many have come from a long distance to receive the word today. And when we are done, when we close in benediction, say amen and leave this place, may we know that we've heard from you. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Start my clock, even though I'm not going to obey it. Uh, excited about um, Cleburne, Texas. We are, we're a church planting, that's what we do, Vision 1200. We will plant, we'll have 1,200 churches in the next four years. We have 400 now, so that's a tripling. Would that be a tripling? Is that right? Right? So 400 tripled is 1,200. Uh, is that right? I think so. All right, three times four is 12. That, I learned that. Cleburne, Texas is, is going to come under uh, our care. We're sending off. Um, brother Texas, the Cassidy family, and uh, he's from Texas and is excited to return there to bring in a harvest in Cleburne. Again, I've told you about Anchorage, and there's other things on, on the horizon of planting churches, believing God to have an English-speaking pastor in Seattle. Would you begin to pray for that? Yeah. Amen. Wonderful to see you guys. So glad you're here. Seattle. I just came back from Seattle area and had a belong class on a Friday night. The same time we were doing one here, I did one there with about 15 to 20 people. And um, that church is uh, really beginning to grow and we're excited about it. That's part of the vision. Everybody say vision. When we came to uh, Alaska from Hawaii 15 years ago this October, we came uh, directly assigned by God, affirmed by Dr. James Morocco, who's our senior global pastor. God gave us a vision for coming to Alaska, and he said, I want you to go because I'm going to bring a great revival, and there's more to it, and I've shared it many, many times in the same way that there's a pipeline from the North Slope to Valdez. I'm sending a pipeline to the golden oil of Zechariah, and I want you to be a part of it. Go. And we quickly moved and left the church in the hands of the Vensons and other leaders there in Kauai, and moved, I felt, like, uh, I felt like we were leaving revival. We came here and uh, to a place that was cold and, um, and dark and void of God, it felt like at first. How many of you know God's everywhere? But we were questioning some of that when we got here. God's poured out His Spirit 
And we are, are seeing just a very, what I believe to be the beginnings of what he wants to do. We're here because of vision. We're here because God opened our eyes to what he wanted to do in this state, along with many others. And we're glad to be a part of a company of people who are believing for revival, not only in Alaska, but in America. And not only in America, but in the nations of the world. And that's why we breathe. That's why we're alive. That's why we do what we do. And we're so grateful to do it. God wants to give vision. God wants to open your eyes. God wants to reveal to you, even today, a fresh plan for your life. Every single person here has a divine assignment from God. Come on, raise your right hand and say, I got a divine assignment from God. Yeah, you do. Before you were in your mother's womb, I don't know what's happened to you. I don't know where you're from. I don't know what you've gone through, but I'm telling you, God has a plan for your life. He has a vision for your life, and any vision from God requires more than you to fulfill it. There's vision and fantasy, which many times, God gives vision, but that vision can become a fantasy. You know what it does? It becomes a fantasy when you cease to do everything you can to see it fulfilled. Many people ride the couch of their blessed assurance, hoping for vision to come about without getting up for morning prayer, without giving, without sacrificing, without laboring. Any vision from God is going to require, if you're going to see it fulfilled, it's going to require you to pay the price, every, everything you got to get it done. And, and really... Even then, it's the Lord that breathes on it and causes it to come to pass. If you're going to see a vision, a dream from God come to pass, you're going to have to give everything you got to see it happen. Is that um, Joyce Meyer? I I love that saying from her. Somebody said, I wish I had the anointing of Joyce Meyer. She flew in. I heard this story recently, but she flew in to... She was preaching for us on Oahu, and she flew in, and they couldn't get to the, um, that's okay. We're going to have a new system in the new church. Amen. He flew in, <laughs> flew in, he couldn't get to the place of the meeting. I think it was to Blaisdell uh, Arena. And so they put her in a helicopter, but they couldn't land the helicopter uh, close enough so they were able to land in a, a, a field. Well, it wasn't just a field. It was, a, it was filled. The field was filled with cow pies. How many of you know what that is? So when she landed and she got out and her dress blew up over her head and she was sprayed with cow turds. She shook it off, went straight to the meeting and had revival. And she said, some of you want the anointing that I have. You don't want the anointing I have. She said, There's a price to pay. There's times where you just got to go through things. And, and she said, you know something? Some of you wish you had the anointing. You don't need a wishbone. You need a backbone. And if you want to see God do something in your life, something in your family, it's going to require you to be diligent. It will require you to be faithful. It's going to require you to have your eyes open to the purpose that you're alive. And so the key to this verse is verse 35. Don't they have a saying, Jesus said, verse 35, and I'm writing the notes now. It's still four months until the harvest. It's still four months of the heart. It was a, it was a statement of procrastination. In other words, ah, you know what? You don't have to do anything right now. This is like four more months, four months, and then the harvest will come. It's a statement of procrastination. And he says, he says what? He says, I tell you, open your eyes and look at the fields. They are ripe for harvest. Everything in your life is going to take vision. The reason this church is here is to plant churches all over. I had somebody say, well, well, the Cassidy's are going. We've, got, we've gotten to be so close, and they're so sweet, and they're beautiful children. They're leaving. I don't want to stay in this church, and people just leave all the time. We're an aircraft carrier. That's what we do. We raise up leaders, and we send them out. Where's my Amsterdam people? You're, you're leaving. We love you. You're going to fulfill. You're going to fulfill the dream. You're going to go fulfill the vision. It, it'll be sad. It's, it's like sad and glad all at the same time. We're expanding our family, expanding our temp pegs. All right. These guys moved to Anchorage. They already commuting back and forth. Hallelujah. Soon you'll be there. There'll be hundreds of people there, thousands of people. Who knows what God will do in Anchorage? Why do you do that? Because we have a vision of planting 1,200 churches in the next four years because we have a vision of reaching the lost. And I will tell you this, the local church is the best way to reach nations. It's the best way to reach the church, a healthy local church. And, and of course, a healthy local church does evangelism. But everything takes vision. And uh, I am hoping... By God's grace, if everything comes together, I'm going to go fishing on Monday. How many of you like fishing? And I'm going to go with my son and nobody else. I'm going to just go chill at the Russian River 
and, and catch reds. Hopefully they're running. Somebody go to get the, check the fish count for me. I'm putting my camper on, and I'm taking off, and I'm going to go fishing. I remember years ago, we went to the Russian River, and there's people pulling fish out left and right, and I'm hardly catching anything. And I noticed everybody had these glasses. Well, they're, 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 Polaroid, they're, they're, they're polarized glasses. And if you put on polarized glasses and you look at a river, you can see the fish. Is any fisherman, any fisherman in here? But if you don't have polarized glasses, you might be able to see them. You're like, oh, they're so thick, I walk across their backs all the way to the other. Yeah, okay, all right, right, okay. And I know that does happen. But when I got glasses, I mean, if you, look, if you don't have your glasses when you go fishing in Alaska, you know, you can still catch fish, but it sure is nice to see them. Remember these guys were at a fishing hole, and he's like, it's right there. And he, he kept, you know, trying to get it out in front and snag it in the mouth. That's how you fish, right? You snag them in the mouth. I remember putting on polarized glasses at the Russian River, and all of a sudden, it was like, fish. I thought, oh, God. Oh, God. Fish. (laughs) Everything in life takes vision. Let's look at the text. I'm going to reference the whole thing, and uh, but we we didn't read it. It starts from uh, John 4 and 4 and following. John 4, 4 says, Jesus, King James says, Jesus must needs go to Samaria. And you say, well, what's that about? He had to go to Samaria. Everybody say he had to go. Had to go. He was on assignment. God had a divine assignment in a place called Samaria, which is unusual because Samaria was considered a cursed place. And if you were a Jew, you wouldn't go through Samaria. You would go around Samaria to avoid them. They were, they're racists. Okay, let me say that over here. I said they were racists. They hated Samaritans. They hated them. Why did they hate them? Samaria was, was a part of, uh, of course, Israel, but then there was Solomon who, while he was the wisest, stupidest guy in the world, Solomon had this amazing wisdom, and then he was dumb as a box of rocks. He, was amazing. he wrote the Proverbs, there's this wisdom of Solomon, except for the fact that he married a thousand wives. One is enough. Come on, somebody say Amen. Married a thousand wives. I'm walking over here at safe distance. <laughs> Marries a thousand wives, breaks God's law, and because of, for the sake of, of David, the kingdom doesn't, isn't taken or divided in his lifetime, but after he dies, it's divided in the lifetime of his sons. Rehoboam, his son, and Jeroboam. If you have a hard time remembering that? Dr. Morocco told me you just remember the Boam boys. Rehoboam, Jeroboam. Northern tribe, southern tribe. The northern tribe is ten tri- t- the northern kingdom. The northern kingdom is ten tribes, and they're carried off. And eventually, Judah is carried off. And I'm getting into all the history. But one of the things Assyria would do is they conquered Israel because Israel fell away from the Lord. Is they would take cultures from other places and mix them with the people. And so, as a result, the cultures and peoples from other places mixed with Jews would they would have a a composite of religion, and their, their, their kids went intermarry, and before you know it, their culture is just totally wiped out. Uh, I, I got myself in trouble a little bit, and I just want to be fair to get in trouble in both services, so uh, that's kind of happening now. You have, you have far-left states sending people up to Alaska to get away from their far-left laws that are over there, and it's coming into the state. So what are you going to do? We have to get them converted, saved, and born again. Can you say amen? No matter what, listen, they're Republican, Democrat. I, there's, there's, there's trouble in all parties. We need a revival all over. Say, so which one are you? I'm a believer. I'm a Christian. Amen. You read the party platform as a biblical believer, you know, it's, it's a no-brainer. Let me just say that because the last time I said it, I lost about 10 people, and we want to try to keep you as long as we can so we can get converted, <laughs> so we can get you converted out of... The insane thinking. I'm not feeling the love. Why don't you lift your hands? And just lift your hands and say hallelujah. hallelujah. All right, if you're offended at that, Joshua Cassidy asked me to share that from Texas. It's, it's good. All right. So what happened is they brought these people intermingling in Samaria, and lions started devouring the people. 
And the king of Assyria said, now, what, what is, the, what is the, the, the God that they worship there? Because that's the problem. They have to worship the God of that land. The God they worship that land is Jehovah or the one true and living God. And so they, they prescribed them to worship, that, worship the Lord. And they did it, but they did it in strange ways. And so Samaritans were hated. And then you had like Sanballat who undermined Nehemiah. And they just... They hated Samaritans. So for the text to say that Jesus had to go to Samaria, it really is quite profound. It's profound because you don't go to Samaria if you're a Jew, but Jesus goes to all walks of life. Can you say yes? He, in fact, he'll come to the Samarias of your life, places you never think God's going to move, places you think that God is void of. He wants to visit that. Even in your own house, in your own home, with your own relatives, he's coming to the Samarias of the world. And so he comes to Samaria with a divine appointment. And I want to tell you prophetically, all of you will have a divine appointment this week. And some of you will have one every single day. When you run into people, understand that's not an accident. I, I pray, I walk with God when I'm running into people. I believe they're divine assignments every time I run into them. I remember driving our Cadillac Seville, 1991 Cadillac Seville, years ago in Kauai. And this thing had a, I don't know, it had a 450, and I straight piped it. It was bad. And we would have to race from one church to the other church, and we had about a 20-something minute drive. And I would finish one service, quick, get in the car, race, go to the other part of the island, and, and, uh, and, then, and then get there and have get there right when worship was over, and then I'd preach and continue on. We had a divine appointment nearly every single, every single Sunday, and I think it's because of Pastor Karen. The divine appointment was uh, Tata, which is a, a name for, like, Grandpa in, in Tagalog, I think, driving a 1970 Datsun, going well below the speed limit. And I would come back, and there was these difficult places to pass, and I'd sit there, and I'd be like, and then get over, rakata, over, kid, kid, I gotta, I gotta, get over, and Karen, Pastor Graham be like, it's a divine appointment. <laughs> Who knows, maybe we would have been killed on one of those turns without those divine appointments. I think that's entirely possible. Come on, Jesus had a divine appointment. Say, I'm, I'm gonna have divine appointments this week. And this woman comes to him in the heat of the day, which is a picture of the fact that you don't go to the well at noon. Well, early morning, late at night, you don't go to the well at noon. It's the heat of the day, but nobody would go at the heat of the day, but she did. Why? Because she slept with half the town. Rip. She was an adulterer. And so she shows up, and it's a picture how she's ostracized and excluded from fellowship in the town. And Jesus reveals himself. Look at verse 26. Jesus declared, I'm the one that's speaking to you. I am he. It takes time to talk with her. You know, it's important to take time to talk with people. We need to take time. She leaves her water pot, and she runs and becomes an evangelist. You know who brings the most people to the Lord in this house? You want to know? It's usually the, the, the new believers, people that have just received Jesus. Because there's something about a new believer where they just like, they just have to tell everybody. I remember stopping cars and people on bikes and just like lost my mind witnessing. And then some would tell you, well, you grow up and you get mature. I think they also call that dead. <laughs> Come on, smile at me and say, he's not talking to me. He's, 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 he's. She becomes an evangelist. She goes to all the men of the town. And Jesus says in verse 32, as they come and they come back with some Taco Bell or whatever they come with, and he says, did they, did they, did he, did he eat something? He says, look at verse 32. He said to them, I have food to eat that you know nothing about. Now food is a, here's a definition of food, a nutritious substance that people, animals eat or drink or that plants absorb in order to maintain life and growth. And he's saying, I have food to eat that you know nothing of. And I first heard that text by Pastor Colleen Morocco, who said, tonight, I'm going to preach on what Jesus eats. And I thought, what, what, is he, what does he eat? It's like hummus and uh, lamb, I guess, and, uh, some Mediterranean. 
falafel or something. I don't, I don't know. What, I don't know what Jesus eats. And verse thirty-four, my food, Jesus said, is to do the will of Him who sent me. Let me let me ask you this: my food is to do the will of Him who sent me. That's why He hung there and He said, "It is finished." He came to do the Father's will. He did it and said, "It's finished." And He said, "My food, my sustenance, is to do God's will." I want to tell you this. I'm, some of you are on a diet, nutrition plan. I try to follow one, mostly, and and that's great. And understand that what you eat will affect you, but but it's really what you believe that's more than anything else. But you do have to take care of this body that you have. And Jesus said, my food is to do the will of it. My sustenance is to do God's will. I will tell you, you know, whatever you're eating, that's providing sustenance for your physical body. But hear this. What are you doing to provide food for your spiritual body? What are you actually doing to cause yourself to grow now? And Jesus is saying to do the will of him who sent me. What is, the, what is the will of him who sent me? To die, to die on a cross? To, to put God on display? Walk the earth for 33 and a half years? Cast out devils? Heal the sick? Set the captives free? Multiplied the loaves and the fishes? Died for you and me? Rose again from the grave? To as many as believed on him, he gave them the right to become children of God. That was what God's plan and purpose was in his first advent, his first coming. Satisfaction and fulfillment never comes by watching. See, some of you in your Christian walk right now, and I only know this by revelation, and in other words, I feel like God spoke this to me to tell you. Some of you are like bored in your Christian walk. If you're bored and your walk with God is ho-hum, there's something wrong. I'll be right back. Amen, Pastor Daniel. That's right. You know that's right. That's right. Your, the walking with, walking with Jesus is the most exciting, exhilarating thing you could do healing the sick, and these signs follow them that believe. Many times people are bored in their walk because they're like waiting for something to happen. They have a fantasy. They don't have vision. Satisfaction and fulfillment, they never come by watching or hearing alone. It comes by doing. It comes by by doing. What do you see us accomplishing here at King's? Why, let me ask you this question. Why are you here? It's because that music is all that, and I just love the word. Okay, great. Awesome. I commend you for that. It's awesome. Do you know all of that is to equip you to go fulfill the call and the purpose and the destiny that you have? Every single one of you have a purpose in God. And when you come to this, this church, you come to a church like this, and there's many others. There's some, there's some that just sort of make you feel good, and you can go home, and then no, there's no challenge. I, I, we will challenge you. We will push you and encourage you. We won't force you, but hope that you meet the God who will encourage you and lead you along and that you obey him. And as you do that, you, you begin to see incredible results in your life. You know, I don't come to church anymore because I need God's help with my marriage. I don't come to church anymore because I need God's help in my emotions so I can get healed. He did that already. He said, well, you're the pastor. Nah, I, I, I know that, but I was, I was coming long before I became a pastor I stopped coming because I needed healing because I got it. And then, you know, as you go along, then there's other things you realize you need healing of, and then you answer that, you get prayed, get prayed for, you get healed. And then you go through things, or maybe death, or lose a child, different things like that, and you need healing for that. No, I, I, I come to church so that, so that I can be a part of this great plan to, to equip the saints for the work of ministry. We encourage one another and, and, and be like a, a burning coal for God along with you. God wants us to do amazing things for him, but so many are blind thinking that it's about someone else or something else. Now, we're going to reach thousands of people. We're going to plant churches all over the world. We're going to move into our new building. Can you say amen? amen. We're going to see a great harvest. Let's look at this text. It's a look at the harvest. Know God's will. Would you say that with me? Know God's will. You got to know God's will for your life. Our whole, my whole life, and really when you draw close to God, which we're all in the process of doing, is about knowing his will. It's something we pray about all the time. Pastor Karen and I eat personal things in our home. Over this past week, we're praying and believing. Lord, what, do you, which, way, which way do we go here with that? What, Lord, what are you saying? Now, we know what God's Word says, 
and then you pray, and then, but there's, there's subtleties and, and leadings and timings, and constantly, the, the believer should constantly be in communion with God Almighty, where he speaks to you to tell you, do it now. Sow that seed now. Call them, call them now. Reach to them now. Wait, don't do that. Take a left turn. Over and over and over and over. That is what we, you're seeking God. He speaks to you. I mean, that goes to Deuteronomy 28, right? If you obey his voice. Some of you don't obey his voice. He told you to stop that, that relationship. You know that, you know that one, that, that, that girl at work that you're flirting with, that one. He told you to stop. Yeah, you don't. You don't stop. You keep doing it. Before you know it, you got a text. Before you know it, you got something sent to you you wish you didn't see. Then you try to hide it. You don't tell your wife. And then you go back and you take a look at it. You should have deleted it, but you didn't. Before you know it, you're back. And then, but you're just headed down the road. You're going to destroy your life. Man, I'm talking to somebody here. Any vision not centered on God's will is a false vision or a vain imagination. All right? All right, you look at this where it says, don't say four more months. It's a, a picture of not delaying your involvement in the harvest. Don't delay your involvement in the harvest. This phrase about procrastination. Anybody ever heard this before? You'd be like, hey, uh, we need some help. We, see, we hear this all the time in the church, unfortunately. Hey, we need some help over here. Would you be able to help? I don't know, Leon. I'm going to pray about that. I'm going to pray about it. Three weeks later, still praying about it. Event's over. And we're on another event. You'd be part of the worship. You know, I, don't, I, need to, I need to pray about that. I don't feel led. You need to get the let out. Get serving. Some people aren't laughing. So we have a next steps desk. That's why we do some of the things that we do so that you can grow in the will of God and find a place of service. You know what many people don't realize? That when you start serving in a local vision, that a corresponding unction of the Holy Spirit will come upon you to do it. So what are you saying? I'm telling you that when you go through the process of the Discover Track and go through training, eventually maybe become a a life group leader, or even just go to a life group, God's presence comes on you in a new way. That it wasn't, he wasn't on you like that before you committed to go to a life group, but now that you're going, something's different. And that unction, that touch of heaven on your life will expand to you at the workplace, in your marriage, with your kids. And I've found that as you take further steps of commitment in God to become more like him, setting yourself free from the yoke, setting yourself free from the things of time and tradition and and things that pollute you, the power of God on you increases. And as he increases, you're starting to find more favor. Well, it's Deuteronomy 28. All of a sudden, man, I'm just like instant parking places where you need to have them. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? I get the best parking places. I mean, that's how, I, I just feel like I get the best everything. Every believer, when you're walking in the will of God, you should expect, oh, I got a deal. Whoop, got another deal. Oh, that was free. Bonus, got parking. Yeah. Hallelujah. And something goes wrong or didn't look like it worked out, you just look like, wow, God, how are you going to turn this around? And then poof, he turns it around. That is the life of a believer that walks in God. Come on, open your eyes to realize your role at this time in history. Plug in and do something for God. I mean, a whole town, a whole town basically comes to Jesus because of this adulteress. Some call her a prostitute. Either way, She's with a few men that Jesus exposes, and she goes back and is used. I don't know what your background is. You might not have some pedigree. Who cares about any of that anyway? God will redeem you. You give your life to him, and he'll use you. Your story is important. What has God done for you? I want you to stir yourself. Stir yourself to reach your neighbors, reach your your loved ones. Talk about what he's done for you. And people are like, I can't. I don't. Then it's hard to talk about what God's done if you haven't had a real encounter with God. Let me run that through one more time. It's a place called Brick Oven Pizza in Kauai. It is, in my remembrance, the best pizza except for 
Ray's in downtown New York. It, great pizza, though. Like, great. Brick oven pizza. I can tell you about the pizza and how we would go in with our kids. or little, little back then. They would give each kid a little handful of dough, and the kids would just play with the dough at the table. And I mean, like, if you're ever in Kauai, it's in Kalaheo. It's called Brick Oven Pizza, and it's amazing. Now, I can tell you that because I've eaten there probably 25 times, and it's amazing. How are you going to tell somebody about the one who told you everything you ever did if you never heard him tell you about everything you ever did? In other words, how are you supposed to share your faith with somebody when you've never really had an encounter with God yourself? And then, and then in many churches, you'll be shamed for that. Shame on you. You never had an encounter with Oh, stop. Stop it. May you have an encounter now. May God touch you now. Worship was beautiful, powerful. Tonight's going to be amazing. God wants to change your life. If you came in this place broken, you're in the right house. You came into this place depressed, you can go out with joy. You came in here with some kind of oppression, disease maybe, or addiction. I don't know where you've come from. I don't know what you've been through. But I'm telling you, God can change your life. God can change you. He can change your life. And when he does, you can't help but talk about the brick oven pizza. Do you understand what I'm saying? So I don't, I'm not looking down my nose at you if you don't share your faith, but you ought to analyze and take a look at your life. Has God touched you in a way that's transformed you? And if he hasn't, don't make some theological excuse or even blame the church or the pastor or the faith. Oh, God doesn't do that anymore or whatever. You get hungry for God and press in and let him change you. Your testimony is one of the most powerful weapons that God has given you. Come on, someone say, open my eyes. Open your eyes. Look at sea to the harvest. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. <laughs> Lift up your eyes to see what God's doing. I think I said this in the first service, but when I was teaching that class, that Belong class on Friday night in Seattle, I flew there, taught the class, jumped back in a plane, jumped right back over here. When I was there, there was a, a family from Mexico, and it was a pastor and his wife and two children. And they sat there because they are considering wanting to be a part of kings. They have no church. They have no building, but they want to start one, and they have a burden to reach people. And they're considering wanting to be a part of kings, so they, they, they're all alone. They don't, have any, they don't have anybody that's over them or anybody helping them. They don't have any... There's no real camaraderie. And so he sat in this and he realized, these guys are touching the nations. And so we talked afterwards. I don't know all that God's going to do through that, but I'm telling you, the reason you're alive is to do the will of God. And it doesn't mean that you'll end up being a pastor. And I said this also in the first service. I'll say it again. If you feel called to be a pastor, take two aspirin, fast, pray, go to sleep, and pray it goes away. If it stays, praise the Lord. My wife said, don't say that, but I am. I am going to say it. It's, it's kind of a joke to say, you better not have just an idea of doing something. Know what God's will is. Begin, come on, if you're supposed to be a king in the house, marketplace, do it. Do it with all your heart. Supposed to be an influencer. Influence people. Was talking to my daughter uh, over yesterday, and she's become TikTok. Fa TikTok? Is there a thing called TikTok? Yeah, the TikTok famous. And so she has this niche that she's doing TikTok. It's also called a niche. And she's doing TikTok and it's, and it's impacting people. She had somebody direct messenger and say, your video really affected my life. That's ministry. Some of you think you have to, you know, have a tie and a, and a, and a microphone. What is it? 20 million people. Some of these folks on TikTok and Instagram, they have 20 million, 20 million. That's the largest, that's bigger than the largest church in the world. 20 million. 20 million people that follow, look on their phones, double tap stuff, look at things, DM each other, watch videos. 20 million people. Do you think we need people influencing on Instagram? And you better believe it. I'm looking at my brother behind the camera right there. 
He's got a, Kemper's got a desire to reach a gaming community. Do you know how many gamers there are? Oh, I got some people's attention right now. You had your face buried in your phone, but now you've looked up. <laughs> gamers out there, how many of you ever, ever played a game? Game, all right. So there's all kinds of games. Some of them are just blatantly demonic, if you ask me, but there's other ones I think are permissible. And on these, there's a gaming community. It's global. It's around the world. They have these huge tournaments and these, I mean, all this stuff. Matthew Cox, who's a, a VP, used to come here as a VP at Google right now. He feels like God put him at Google. Mute, please. Welcome back. <laughs> Start saying stuff. He, listen to me. I'm never gonna get. I'm never gonna get one of those things, Alexa, because they're gonna hear. They, yeah, they already hear everything you say on your phone. So just. Uh, I was with somebody who was very persecuted by some of the things that went happened during the election, and uh, and while I'm talking, we start talking. He says, "I'm sorry. Hold on a second. He puts his phone like in his bag under the table. He says, "We can talk now." I said, "Seriously?" He said. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. They, they ransacked my cloud. They took all my stuff off of my... They, 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 yeah. Oh, yeah. No, they listen to everything, everything you say. Okay. The point is, we need to influence. We need, we need influencers for the kingdom in every area of life. We need... Come on, Mayor Edna. Thank God for Mayor Edna. Put your hands together for Mayor Edna. No... We need people to run for office. We need people to, to create fashion, you know, things. <laughs> to be in the trending thing. Why? Because the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ needs to be moved out beyond the four walls of the church. Get a vision bigger than yourself. Yes, church will do this. This will never stop. Somebody said, church will, always, church will never be like this. It'll be all viral. You, can, you, you, you got something viral. I think you need healing. <laughs> That's not what's going to happen. Because you can't, that, that, this communion, you can't lay hands on somebody. You can't, you can't look somebody in the face. There's, there's touch is important. C conversation's important. And you can't, you could turn me off right now. Online. If you do it, you might get Emrons or something, but I'm just telling you, you could. <laughs> Raise your hands to heaven as the worship team comes all across this place. Come on. What are you saying? I'm telling you to open your eyes. What can you do? What can you do to expand? Uh, our, our dear brother Texas over here, he wants to do movies for Christ. He's got an amazing gift. Amazing gift. And that's happened in different places. I'm asking you, God Show your people their involvement in the harvest. And it doesn't necessarily need, need to be in this corporate setting that we have that's traditional. But by all means, it should tie to the local house. Absolutely. We're here. Why? To reach this state. We can't do it without each other. Lord, open my eyes to see the wondrous things from your word. Lord, open my eyes to see the harvest. The sower and the reaper, verse 36, even now, the one who reaps draws a wage and harvests a crop for eternal life so that the sower and the reaper may be glad together. Thus the saying, quote, one sows and another reaps is true. I sent you to reap what you have not worked for. Others have done the hard work. Wow. And you have reaped the benefits of their labor. We are entering into the greatest time of harvest of souls. What are you saying, Pastor? I'm telling you to get to work. What do you mean? Find a place to serve in the church. Find a place to serve outside of the church. Take a look at your life and say, God, what is my life about? And I'm going to tell you, you can have, listen to me. Y'all listen. Y'all listening? Not if you're listening. Okay. You have all the money in the world. It won't satisfy you. I've been at funerals 
where wealthy people off themselves. You know what off means? They took their own lives. I mean, if, it, if money was to be the thing, then you have all these very wealthy people wouldn't be getting divorced and, and, and overdosing if it was about money. It's not about money. So whoever told you that, that's a lie also. No, it's about being satisfied because you're fulfilling your God-given, ordained, divine assignment in the earth. That is what it's about. Oh, and it takes money, and it takes anointing, and it takes people. But I'm telling you, will you please seek God? Will you please get involved in some capacity? Why? Because there's thousands upon thousands of people that are going to hell and they're distraught. On Wednesday nights, we've had deliverance for two weeks in a row. I don't know what's going to happen on this Wednesday. But I've seen people come in this place broken, faces distorted, get up off the ground. And they, they, they look like a different human being. Why is that? They had some brick oven pizza. That's why. They had something. They tasted and seen. Something's changed. I had somebody stop me in the, at the gym and say, I've got a whole bunch of children. In the past six months, all of my kids have been impacted. Listen, if you're here for the very first time and you're offended and you're not going to come back, would you please give us two or three more shots? And if you've come and your life's not been transformed yet, you know, it takes a little soap in the shower to get clean. Thanks for listening to this message today. If the Holy Spirit is speaking to you and you realize that you need Jesus as your Savior and you'd like to pray with me to either commit your life to Jesus for the first time or rededicate your life to the Lord, repeat this prayer after me. Father God, thank you for sending your son Jesus to die for my sins. Jesus, thank you for dying for me and bringing me forgiveness. I'm sorry for my sins. I repent of them today and I ask you to cleanse me and wash me of all my sin. I commit to live for you all the rest of the days of my life. And I pray this in your name, Jesus, amen. If you prayed that prayer today, would you text the word SAVED to 907-357-2065? We'd like to send you some information and some materials that will help you in your Christian walk. God bless.